this conference, which is very intense and very serious as a fellow who always does a sort of a comedic uh, uh, rehash of all the things that we've just heard. And uh, one of the things that happened in the session with Michael, and I was in the same session, is uh, uh, first Rick Warren, Pastor Rick, Rick Warren, the uh, author of uh, Purpose Driven Life, he gave a talk, and then I gave a talk sort of deconstructing his book. <laughs> <laughs> Doing, doing the, the reverse engineering of, of his uh, religious design. And uh, uh, it, it led to uh, quite an interesting uh, sort of confrontation. It wasn't that confrontational. Wa Warren walked out. He wouldn't. <laughs> um, and then the comedian at the end, uh, uh, picking up on, on Michael's, uh, Michael presented uh, the same things that you just heard, um, uh, claimed to have found a a song where, you, where, what was it, it was, reading, it was reading Rick Warren backwards and it says, Dan Dennett is Satan, Dan Dennett is Satan. It was, it was, it was pretty funny, I hope, I hope. So, uh, after 9-11 I was thinking about the huge role that religion plays in our lives and trying to figure out where I thought it was going. And I thought, I don't know, I have any idea. I have no idea what's going to happen to religion in the 21st century, and I think that's pretty scary. And I thought, looked around, and it seemed to me nobody else did either. And I thought, well, why not? It, one of the reasons is that we're not studying religion with the same intensity that we're studying the economy, fossil fuels, global warming, uh, uh, all the other big phenomena, the big problematic phenomena in the world, and, and we should. And so the title of my book really is uh, about let me see if I can go back to it here. Yeah. The spell I want to break is the spell which says, thou shalt not study religion objectively, scientifically. I think whatever you want to happen to religion, your best chances of getting what you want is to understand the phenomena better so that you can fix it or destroy it or change it. Whatever you want to do, it, it, it pays it pays, as always, to gather more scientific knowledge of it. I just want to dramatize how, how little we know about what's going to happen to religion by giving you five scenarios. There's others we could have chosen. These are five scenarios. One of them might be true. Just think about it. See which one, which one you think might be true. Some people think that, you know, the Enlightenment is over and religion is sweeping the planet and it's going to continue sweeping the planet until one religion goes to fixation. Now, which religion is that going to be? It's not clear. It might be Christianity. It might be Islam. Uh, and it might happen in a few weeks or months or it might happen in a few years. Uh, this is the current rough breakdown of religions around the world. And uh, notice that no matter what religion you are, if you are one, uh, in this audience, I don't suppose there are probably that many that, that do have a religion, but whatever religion you have, it's the minority. So that more people don't want it to sweep to fixation than want it to sweep to fixation. You might reflect on what that means about the future of this planet. But of course, that's just one scenario. This is not working as well as it should. Um, another one is that religion is in its death throes. Contrary to what others have said, what we're seeing now are the paroxysms, the dying gasps of religion, and maybe in the lifetime of your own grandchildren, the Vatican City will become the European Museum of Roman Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mecca will become Disney's magic kingdom of Allah. <laughs> uh, seems a little unlikely, I know, but but bear in mind that the Hagia Sophia, it started off as a church, then it became a mosque, and today it's a museum. It's worth remembering. So, but there's two hypotheses. Here's another one. Maybe religions are going to change. They're going to transform themselves into sort of creedless moral teams with pageantry, with songs, with traditions, with colors, and they may specialize in one moral effort or another, but, you know, leaving out the creeds. Maybe it'll all be just sort of evolving pageantry. That's another prospect. <laughs> might happen. Who knows? Another possibility might be that religion will simply sink into the background. It will diminish in prestige and visibility rather like smoking. And that, although right now it's very high status to be very religious, it may be, maybe the religious people will be, will be sort of like the people huddled out in the rain outside buildings, you know, uh, having their cigarettes. <laughs> Seems unlikely, but then there's another prospect to consider. Then, of course, there's one more prospect to consider, and that is 
Judgment Day arrives. <laughs> now, oddly enough, or not so oddly, according to Newsweek magazine, the majority of Americans believe this one. 57% according to a recent poll. It's worth reflecting on that. Now, with all those different hypotheses, the important thing to remember is all but one of them at most is wildly wrong, and nobody knows which one's right. Nobody. I don't know, and you don't know. Nobody knows. That's why we really should study religion as intensively as we can to try to get a better handle on this, because there may be something we'll want to do to try to steer the phenomena in the future. Now, consider this wonderful dairy cow. What a, what a magnificent beast this is. Um, who designed it? Well, some people say, God designed it. But of course, the dairy cow is an interesting, as a domesticated animal, it's an interesting amalgam of design processes for many millions of years. This is its, its ancestor, the aurochs. It was a wild animal and it was designed by the process of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, without any help from many human beings. Then it became domesticated and at first there was no intention to redesign it so much, but the, just the favoring of individuals uh, uh, in the herd gradually led to the redesign of the animal. And then eventually it became methodically redesigned by animal breeders, as Darwin is wonderful on the transition between methodical design and what he calls unconscious selection, methodical selection and unconscious selection. And eventually, of course, you, you get an animal which really is been, has been intelligently designed and redesigned. The, the, uh, there's been a lot of effort put into trying to reverse engineer the dairy cow and figure out how the parts work and how to make the parts work better. Now, I use that as an analogy because what I'm arguing in my book is the same thing is true of religion. Religions are designed things, and part of their design is unconscious natural selection, not involving human beings at all, really. Part of it is unconscious redesign by human beings, and then there's part of it that's deliberate design by human beings. And that's the story that I want to sketch out for you. That's one of the main themes that runs through my book. In other words, what we're going to do here is recognize that religions are brilliantly designed products. Now, let me pause for a moment, because a lot of people, they hear about my book, they start reading about it, and they say, Dennett wants to destroy religions. And that is not true. I, I don't know what I think should happen to religion, but I do recognize that they are some of the most brilliantly designed social institutions on the planet. They've been around for thousands of years. We jolly well should understand what makes them tick. We should look under the hood and find out what makes them tick, because maybe we want to use them for something really important. Don't destroy all that wonderful design just because just you don't like it. Let's understand it first. So we want to understand their evolutionary history. What we want to do is reverse engineer religions. Now, if Martian scientists came to Earth, they would be mightily impressed with some of the things they saw on this planet. I'm going to show you a few pictures to show you what, what might attract the attention of Martian scientists. Why do I talk about Martian scientists? Because it helps to make the familiar strange. We're so used to having religion all around us that we tend not to notice what's bizarre or striking about it. It helps if you can sort of adopt a Martian perspective. And I think one of the things that would impress the Martians uh, uh, when they came to our planet would be this. Now, who knows what this is? One person here knows, and I want to thank him with, from the bottom of my heart because he sent me this picture. What is it? Some, I've asked people, is it, is it a whale? Is it, is, it, is it bacteria in a culture dish? No, no it's not the Hindenburg. <laughs> this is what it is. I can get my thing to work. This is approximately a million human beings gathering on the banks of the Ganges in 2001. Probably the largest gathering of human beings in one place ever, as seen from a satellite. Wow. That would have certainly attract the Martians' attention. So would this. 
smaller crowd or this smaller crowd 